And so uh, my name is Emily Reinhardt, and I'm Great Forest Director of Sustainability Services. And for those of you joining us uh, who may be less familiar with our work, Great Forest has been in the business of sustainable waste management for over 30 years. We also broker waste hauling services. Uh, so we have a wide uh, lens into the industry and work to balance a range of perspectives. And so today we will present this year's uh, Earth Day theme by providing an overview of plastics pollution and food waste, two critical components of our global waste problem. I'll spend some time contextualizing the gravity of the problem, and my colleagues will discuss how we got here and what's being done currently. We will also leave some time at the end for Q&A, so if you have any questions during the presentation, please send them in the, either in the Q&A function or the chat. And as you may know, we'll also be recording today's session uh, to share with those of you who are um, your colleagues who are unable to attend. And joining me today in the discussion will be my colleagues, Anna Dengler and James Bernard. They each have uh, unique backgrounds and individual insights important to these topics. And so this year's Earth Day theme, as I uh, said, is invest in our planet. I mean, this is a pretty pointed topic, uh, particularly because over the last several years, it's become increasingly clear that there's a direct correlation between sustainable business practices, share prices, and business performance. Companies who develop strong environmental social governance, ESG standards, have better profitability, stronger financials, happier employees, and more resilient stock performance. And with our background in waste, it makes sense uh, to focus on what we know best. And the biggest problems in waste today, arguably, are food waste and plastics pollution. So I'll get started by providing some background to our waste problem, um, a very brief history of plastics. Uh, so uh, natural polymers such as horn, tortoise shell, amber, rubber, shellac, they've been around since antiqu antiquity. Uh, so animal horns, uh, which are malleable when heated, were used for many purposes and products, from medallions to cutlery. And so the coat making industry was one of the biggest applications of horn in the 1800s. Uh, but the story of synthetic polymers or plastics began in earnest in the mid 19th century. So in the wake of industrialization, animal derived materials were becoming increasingly scarce and elephants were facing extinction if ivory demand continued on its current course. And so by 1856, there was a man named Alexander Parks who patented Parks sign, uh, which is considered the first human made plastic. Parks sign was a cheap and colorful substitute for ivory and tortoise shell. And uh, moving to 1907, Belgian chemist Leo Bakeland, he pioneered the first fully synthetic plastic, and this would spark a consumer boom in affordable, yet highly desired products that included an iconic camera, telephone, and radio um, that are pictured on the slide. And so through the early 1900s, the petroleum and chemical industries began to form alliances out of the desire to use uh, waste material from the processing of crude oil and natural gas. And one abundant uh, byproduct you might know the name of is ethylene gas. And it was experiments with ethylene that came polyethylene, which is now the world's most abundant plastic. Polyethylene was a marble, right? It was strong, flexible, and heat resistant. And its first application was actually insulating radar cabling during World War II, uh, but consumer products soon followed, right? So plastic shopping bags, the Tupperware containers, to artificial um, knee and hip joints even. And so, this, you know, ubiquity of plastics is really when it became more of a problem. Um, it started to replace more expensive paper, glass, and its metal counterparts, uh, particularly in consumer packaging. And so that economics of mass-produced cheap plastic products have led to a single-use culture. And today, around 500 billion uh, plastic bottles are sold every year. And those same chemical properties that have made plastic an incredibly useful and durable material also make it really difficult to dispose of. And so with that, uh, plastic pollution is a global issue that poses threats to the health and productivity of our environment, right? And unfortunately, the majority of plastics are not recovered for recycling. And the recycling rate uh, remains extremely low and it's um, less than 9% in the US. Uh, Single-use plastics also account for 40% of the plastic produced every year, 
And many of these products like plastic bags, food wrappers have a lifespan of mere minutes to hours, yet they persist in the environment for hundreds of years. And that's often cleaned up at the public's expense. There's also uh, no uh, parent end in sight. Half of all plastics ever manufactured have been made since 2005 and production is expected to double by 2050. And so this excess plastics uh, makes its way into our waterways at really staggering rates. Uh, every year, about 8 million tons of plastic waste leaks into the ocean from coastal nations. Uh, and if we keep producing and failing to properly dispose of uh, plastics at the predicted rates, plastics will outweigh fish pound for pound by 2050. Pretty staggering. And estimates suggest that plastic packaging represents the majority share of that leakage. So what this all means is that plastics are a major climate concern. Plastics uh, generate greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions rather, at every step of its life cycle from extraction to waste. And the World Economic Forum predicts that by 2050, uh, emissions associated with plastics could account for 15% of the global uh, annual carbon budget. And so in sum, <laughs> not to be too over the head with all these statistics, but plastics are everywhere, right? From the air we breathe, the water we drink and the food we eat. And so now that I've contextualizing, uh, that I've contextualized some of the overarching problems associated with the ubiquity of plastics, uh, Anna will provide an overview of what is being done to help address plastics pollution, both globally and down to the individual level. Thank you, Emily. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing to address plastics. Um, and the good news is that there is a lot of effort right now uh, with people all over the world uh, looking at this problem. Uh, one recent win for environmentalists was the UN resolution. This just uh, came about about a month ago uh, to adopt a global treaty to combat plastic pollution. Uh, this treaty is set to address the full life cycle of plastic, including production, design, and disposal, with wealthier countries supporting those uh, with less infrastructure to handle uh, plastic waste. Uh, the UN adoption of the treaty was uh, unanimous by all nations with the goal of a binding treaty by the end of 2024. Uh, the biggest producers of plastic in the world are the wealthiest. Um, and we all have systems, albeit imperfect systems, in place to handle the large volume uh, of plastics disposed of, including exporting plastic waste to other countries. Uh, so it's no surprise uh, that countries that do not dispose, that do not produce plastic are asking uh, for help with this problem. So this is why a global treaty is so important. Uh, we are all in this together. Uh, we all have an impact and we're all impacted uh, by pollution. So here in the US, we have adopted uh, a 50 by 30 program, meaning we are going to uh, endeavor to increase our recycling rate from 35% to 50% by the year 2030. Um, the U.S. recycling goal will require us to reduce contamination in the recycling stream, improve recycling processing, and strengthen our economic markets for recycled materials. Uh, to do this, uh, we're going to need increased public education, uh, as well as investment in our waste management industry, um, as well as improve access to recycling, since uh, across the U.S. we have very different levels of access to uh, recycl uh, recycling programs. And certainly recycling isn't the only solution to our plastics crisis, um, but considering how pervasive plastic has become, as Emily said, uh, recycling is a part of the circular economy and recycling 35% isn't enough. On the legislative side, um, a bill is currently making its way through Congress uh, called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Uh, and this goes beyond the recycling goals to target pollution uh, related to uh, our plastics. Um, it supports programs that reduce the amount of single use plastics. Uh, it helps enact producer, it will help enact producer responsibility and it intends to pause new or expanded plastic production. 
Um, communities of color, low, in, uh, low income communities and indigenous communities are disproportionately located near plastic production and waste disposal facilities like landfills and incinerators. Uh, so this bill sets out to address this and other impacts on human health, uh, as well as help the economy and create jobs. Uh, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act actually builds on statewide laws across the country, such as the Extended Producer Responsibility, or EPR, um, or EPR as it's known, uh, which uh, many other countries have uh, already adopted. Here in the US, Maine and Oregon have adopted uh, EPR bills, um, and, uh, and many other uh, states are are considering them as well, including uh, New York, where I am, and California, where James is. Um, and this really sets out to put pressure on companies to either fix the package waste problem or pay for the disposal costs. Uh, and large companies are aware of the EPR bills and are looking to make changes to get ahead of them. Uh, companies that would be impacted by these bills have actually been pushing the market on sourcing more recycled plastics for packaging. So that's that's a good sign. Um, so how does EPR work? Um, EPR, this is an image from the World Wildlife Fund. They definitely have a stake in making uh, taking plastics out of the environment. So uh, they're really supportive of this. It means shifting the responsibility and costs to the producers, which include importers, brand owners, and fillers. I will say that this diagram isn't indicative of all PR, EPR setups, um, but this is one way to do it. Um, so the government sets the EPR fees and producers uh, sell the products and pay those fees uh, to help offset the costs that uh, we're already paying uh, waste management operators to uh, to to dispose of and recycle the waste. And this also includes informing and educating consumers about waste reduction and segregation. So that is some of the activity happening on the regulatory side. Now I'd like to take a step back and talk about um, plastics and recycling um, because not all plastic is easily recyclable. Um, here are the resin codes most people associate with recycling. It's the chasing arrows symbol. So the numbers inside uh, the triangle indicates the type of plastic. Uh, with different plastics having uh, different attributes and a range of potential impact on human health and the environment. Uh, plastics approved for food use include PET, number one, number two, HDPE, and number five, polypropylene. However, uh, every single uh, category of plastic could leach hazardous materials if put in an extreme uh, situation such as extreme heat. Uh, for purposes of recycling, uh, ones and twos are the most common types uh, to be picked up by recycling programs. Um, however, just because there is a chasing arrows symbol doesn't mean that there is a market to recycled materials. So knowing which plastics your commercial waste hauler or your residential recycling program accepts is really important. Uh, here in New York City, where I am, all rigid plastics are accepted regardless of the number inside the chasing arrow symbol. Um, and in other, case, in other areas, that is not the case. Uh, they do pay attention to the numbers. So you have to know your program. Um, so if the chasing arrow symbol doesn't help or gives you limited information about whether your package can be recycled or not, um, they now have something called this how to recycle symbol, um, such as what you see on uh, the right side of the screen. Um, this gives uh, simple recycling instructions where you can, uh, you can find out more info um, by going to their website. Um, so that is, that is a great initiative. So be on the lookout for those symbols. But to go back to the story of plastics, um, to make it more confusing, there are also plant-based plastics. So I would like to take a moment to do a poll um, and ask the question, so when you receive uh, plant-based plastics, whenever you have in the past, or if you received it in the future, how would you uh, dispose of that? 
plastic? Would you send it to a commercial compost collection, a uh, plastics recycling collection, or the trash? So if you could um, answer that question, um, we can uh, collect that information and share the results. In the meantime, I'll just say, you know, there is certainly controversy around whether these plastics are better for the environment. For instance, although um, bioplastics replace the feedstocks for traditional plastics made from uh, petrochemical resources, natural gas and petroleum, how do you dispose of it? And that's the complicating question. So do we have the results of our poll? Oh, oh, interesting. I was not expecting this. Uh, the winner is plastics recycling collection, closely followed by commercial compost collection, closely followed by trash collection. This is so interesting um, because obviously there is confusion. What do you do? And it does make sense that there would be answers all over the place because the correct answer is not on this list. It depends. Um, what you need to look for uh, in bioplastics is the green stripe and BPI certified symbol that you see right here, BPI compostable. Um, this certified symbol uh, means that it can be composted. But again, you want to know what bioplastics uh, are accepted in your program. So if you have a commercial waste hauler and they say we accept um, bio uh, plant-based compostable plastics, look for this symbol and that can go in your composting program. Um, however, that is not always the case. You may not have that available. You may have a composting program and, uh, and you, you can't put it in your backyard compost, for example. So in that case, it, it does need to go in the trash bin. It does not go in the recycling bin. And that, is the, that was the most common answer. And unfortunately, at the moment, it is not easily separated out um, because there are so many different types of plastic. You know, those ones and twos, they're, they're not made of bioplastics. Um, those are the most commonly recycled. And this is a, a plastic that is just too new to the market. There isn't a market to recycle it just yet. It could be recycled, but we have to, we have to know our markets. So, so this kind of leads me to the question. So if we're putting, you know, a compostable, BPI certified compostable cup in one composting program, um, but there's another plant-based cup that can't be composted, why is that? Why doesn't all bioplastic biodegrade? And the real question is, why doesn't all plastic biodegrade? Um, after all, plastics made from fossil fuels were once dinosaurs and ancient plants. And, you know, what I like to think of is like, what do all these things have in common? Carbon, <laughs> the source of life. The thing is to make plastic, you need lots of energy to form these, what you see on the screen, carb, really strong carbon-carbon bonds. And that is not something found in nature. So nature doesn't really know what to do with it. They can't break it down. Um, in the future, there might be organisms that are able to break down these strong bonds, but at the moment, you know, that's why plastic is just proliferated in the environment, unless it's in a landfill or burned, you know, it's it's out there in existence. So bottom line, we want to avoid uh, replacing single use traditional plastics with single use bio-based plastic without considering other options. So let's talk about what other options are and what people are doing about plastic. Um, there's a lot being done to promote um, plastic alternatives. And here's one example from a great forest client, the Four Seasons Hotel San Francisco. Um, they had single use uh, plastic bottles in all of the all of the rooms and they've replaced those now with aluminum cans of water. So they're able to still provide the same service, uh, but with much less plastic. And aluminum is a great alternative because it can be recycled many times over without degrading quality and there's a strong market for the material. We've also worked with office buildings uh, on redesigning their waste infrastructure 
programs by eliminating dust side bins. Um, and dust side bins have plastic liners. And uh, if you remove all of that, you reduce your plastic. Um, obviously, we also like to promote a centralized waste bin system because it makes it easier for people to see, oh, there is a bin for my plastic bottle to be recycled and uh, makes people put a little bit more thought into how you dispose of things. Um, but we, we piloted uh, a centralized bin system, removing all of the dust side bins, and we're able to remove over 1,000 plastic bin liners a day at that client office. Other plastic alternatives are the reusable kind, and we all know these mugs instead of coffee cups and silverware instead of plasticware. That's stuff you're familiar with, especially since companies are always trying to give you or sell you uh, a reusable bag or a reusable mug. Um, but to make a bigger impact through reuse, um, there are zero waste stores popping up that encourage shoppers to bring their own containers to fill. Um, and there's a company called Loop, which has actually taken this uh, step further by working with uh, large companies like McDonald's and Walgreens. Uh, they're working to create reusable packaging that can be then returned to the store. Um, uh, right now, Loop is in the process of working directly with stores uh, and stock products across the globe. So, so look out for that. That's coming. Um, and then at an individual level, there is also a movement toward uh, minimizing consumption. Uh, there's a documentary called The Minimalists, Less is Now on Netflix. Uh, they have a pod, the minimalists have a podcast and books as well. Um, but uh, minimalism isn't uh, strictly about addressing waste, but rather overconsumption. Uh, this is the counterculture against excess stuff we have in our lives, and this is about really being thoughtful about the possessions that we have. Uh, the important thing about minimalism is that it's not about deprivation. You want to have, you know, the life that you want to have with the things that you want, but not all of the excess stuff that is really weighing us down and stressing us out. Um, it has a lot of negative consequences that we don't necessarily think of um, as related to just the material stuff that we have. So, um, yeah, it's about having materials we really need and purging the rest. The goal is uh, letting go of our need to consume and have the newest and latest thing, all of which comes with plastic packaging. <laughs> So what can you do in your home or business? So an audit is a good place to start. Uh, you can audit your business, you can audit yourself or your household, uh, take a look at your waste stream from one day or one week and separate out the plastic waste. Um, Great Forest performs lots of audits. We've probably done an audit for you. Um, and we compiled a report of over 100 audits that we did in 2019. And we found that plastic was the least likely to be properly sorted. So if you do a waste audit, look out for the plastic. Where's the plastic ending up? Um, an alternative option to digging through your trash bags is think before you throw. Um, this is a sample data sheet that is provided by the USGBC. If you go on to their uh, website for TRUE, uh, that's their zero waste certification program. TRUE has a spreadsheet that you can download and use. You just print it out and put it next to your bins, your recycling and waste bins, and just mark, you know, what's ending up in the trash as you're throwing it. And after you've compiled that, you can say, did it go in the appropriate bin? And what's the zero waste action I can take to reduce this waste and get it to the right place? Um, so while taking personal responsibility for your own consumption is great, uh, we can also make an impact in our neighborhoods. Uh, so National Geographic has an app to help track plastic pollution wherever you are. Um, this is a screenshot of it called Marine Debris Tracker. You can find that on your phone. Um, when my son and I uh, went uh, picking up plastic waste on the Hudson River recently, um, we had a great time. We used uh, garden gloves, rubberized garden gloves, and a grabber, and some plastic bags, some reused plastic bags. And we actually picked up 170 cigarette butts from the sidewalk uh, and 53 plastic pieces 
all over. Um, 30 food wrappers and 30 PPE, which is mainly masks and gloves um, from the water side. So uh, among other lots of things there, um, but we had a lot of fun doing it. And I encourage you to download this app. There are other apps that can, that can do this as well. Um, so look out for those and, uh, and get a group together. It's a lot of fun. So in conclusion, make plastic work harder for you. Um, plastic was made to be durable and never go away. So we need to stop thinking of plastic as disposable. So say no to single use plastic. Uh, think before you throw. Not only so materials get to the right bin, but so also you consider um, what zero waste alternatives could be used the next time. Um, when you recycle, know what plastics are accepted in your area and look for that how to recycle symbol. Um, bioplastics don't be fooled or, uh, or uh, go into false, uh, fooled into false complacency around bioplastics and look for the BPI uh, certified symbol. And finally, download an app and get involved in tracking and cleaning up plastic pollution. Uh, there is a lot to be done and everyone has a part to play. So there's, there's so much more to talk about plastics, but I'll leave it with that and <laughs> take it back, Emily. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, I actually just found some misplaced plastic in my trash bin last night. So no matter how much you know, you think about these things, um, you know, live and breathe it. <laughs> it's your career path. It's always important to remain thoughtful because the market changes and, um, you know, it's, it's not always clear. So it's important to be thoughtful. And the how to recycle label is definitely helpful to do that. Um, and so turning from plastic pollution, which is, you know, very much a major issue and critically important to addressing climate change, you know, I, as a home cook, as someone who grew up in a household with a mom who was a home cook, you know, food and food waste, I kind of think of as a little bit more fundamental, you know, food is love and culture and really part and parcel to what makes us human. And James will certainly delve into uh, the technicality of addressing food waste, but also some of those great grayer areas, right? So the behavioral psychology involved, for example. So before uh, James takes it away, I'm going to introduce a little bit about um, the food waste problem. So in the U.S., food waste is estimated um, at between 30 and 40 percent of the food supply, and the USDA estimates 31 percent of food loss is at the retail and consumer levels. What this means is that wasting resources that could be otherwise uh, conserved for more productive uses. So when food is wasted, so too is the land, the water, the labor, energy, and other inputs that are used in processing, producing, transporting, preparing, sorting, and disposing of all that discarded food. And in the US, uh, food is the single largest category of material that's placed in municipal landfills where it emits methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas that's 30 times more potent than CO2, carbon dioxide. And municipal solid waste landfills are the third source of methane emissions in the US and accounted for about 15% of emissions generated by human activity in 2019. Uh, so these are really big figures we're talking about. And when it comes to mitigating climate change, Project Drawdown ranks reducing uh, food waste as the third most impactful action behind only better management of refrigerants and increased onshore wind power. And for context, electric vehicles rank 26th. And for additional context, uh, the methane emissions from mun municipal solid waste landfills in 2019 were approximately equivalent to the greenhouse gas emissions from more than 21.6 million uh, passenger vehicles driven over a one year period, or the carbon dioxide emissions from nearly 12 million homes energy use for a year. And landfill methane represents 12% of the global methane total. And now I will um, let James take it away. Thank you, Emily. Um, I'm going to serve you up some pie first. Two pie charts. The one on the left uh, shows food waste generation by percentage. And the one on the right shows food waste management by percentage. You can see that generation of food waste is mostly through manufacturing and processing. Um, the next highest category is us, residential, but also 
significant amounts from restaurants and supermarkets. Um, food waste management, most of it goes to the landfill, 35%. Um, a lot still goes to animal feed, and that is the easiest way for manufacturers and processors to um, use to, to manage their food waste. Um, composting, you'll see, is a very small slice of pie at 3%, and anaerobic digestion is a growing percentage, but still quite low. So we want to set the context by talking about food loss versus food waste. Food loss takes place at production, post-harvest, uh, all processing stages, and during distribution. Food waste happens at retail and at consumption, which is us. The types of food waste uh, to be considered are avoidable food waste. In other words, edible, what would be edible um, food waste. And an example of that would be a, a moldy loaf of bread. Uh, unavoidable food waste would be something like eggshells, which we wouldn't eat, although it, they make nice compost. Potentially avoidable food waste, uh, potentially edible food waste would be carrot peels, potato peels, things that we could eat or could use in making broth or other uh, forms of edible food. We're gonna use the uh, US Environmental Protection Area Agency food recovery hierarchy to uh, walk you through how to best recover and reduce uh, food waste. The most preferred uh, are at the top, and we'll start with them, and then we'll end up with the least preferred alternatives at, at the end. The first uh, step on the hierarchy and where we can make the most difference is reducing uh, at the source, reduce the volume of surplus food generated. And because I live and work in California, I'm going to give you some California-based statistics. 4.6 million Californians, or one in eight, are food insecure, including one in five children. Uh, but at the same time, we're, we're putting five and a half million tons of food waste into California landfills each year. And we really haven't been tracking food waste, don denotable, donatable potential food waste uh, very carefully. It only started in 2018. Feed hungry people uh, is the next uh, step on the hierarchy, donating extra food to food banks, soup kitchens, shelters. In California, uh, we've broken near ground, new ground with the edible food recovery area in, through Senate Bill 1383, which requires that by 2025, we'll recover 20% uh, of food that would normally be sent to the landfill. Um, it establishes food recovery programs. Um, food donors must arrange to recover the maximum amount of their edible food waste that would otherwise go to landfills. And food recovery organizations and services that participate must maintain records. Right now, um, this law was passed in 2016, but as of January 1st, 2022, Supermarkets and large grocery stores, uh, food services providers, distributors, wholesale vendors uh, are to comply with the law. Um, a lot of our clients, which would be hotels with on-site food facility or 200 or more rooms, large restaurants, health facilities, don't have to comply until January of 2024. Just illustrating a couple of the um, ways that and organizations that are helping to feed hungry people. Uh, we have a Great Forest has a relationship with Replate, which is a food recovery organization. Um, it's a, a technology-based social enterprise that redistributes food 
from businesses to serve communities in need. And uh, shout out to uh, the replay folks who are on, on the webinar today. And um, we're trying to help um, find partners for their enterprise. Food Shift is located in the East Bay. Um, it's a project of uh, Earth Island Institute, and it is taking those recovered foods and reinventing them into edible byproducts and nutritious marketable products. They definitely say that they're not competing with other food recovery programs for additional produce donations. These are just two examples of what's going on in California. Feeding animals is the next step on the hierarchy, diverting food scraps to animal feed. Uh, maybe we should go back to the future. In the 1930s, uh, drivers during the depression would go directly into homes and collect food scraps that they took to piggeries. Um, I used to work in the retail produce business for a large grocery chain, and we had a relationship with an independent pig farmer uh, that unfortunately uh, was ended by the corporation. But it's a way to transfer food waste into productive uh, agriculture. And we really got away from this because convenience particularly in the 50s, uh, dictated that everything was tossed into trash cans and then went to landfills. Industrial uses is the next step on the hierarchy, uh, providing waste oils for uh, re rendering and fuel. Um, rendering has been very traditional, uh, taking fat and solid meat products and converting them into a basis for cosmetics, soap, and other products. Uh, we've all seen biodiesel, um, the fats, oils, and grease that are collected and go into biodiesel fuel. Um, many of our buses in San Francisco are uh, proudly displaying biodiesel stickers. Um, they, that reduces greenhouse gas, sulfur dioxide emissions, and anaerobic digestion, fats, oils, and grease can be added to anaerobic digesters at wastewater treatment plants uh, to generate renewable energy in the form of biogas. Uh, industrial uses also include providing food scraps for digestion to recover energy. And this is a diagram that shows what goes into anaerobic digesters, manure, bio, wastewater biosolids, food, and what can be generated through anaerobic digestion is biogas um, for electricity, heat, vehicle fuel, renewable natural gas, but also uh, the, the digestate can be turned into organic fertilizer, animal bedding, other products. Composting is the next step on the hierarchy, um, creating a nutrient rich soil amendment. This is a photograph of uh, uh, Jepson Prairie uh, where San Francisco's compost is made. Uh, this is known as a covered aerated static pile. It's aerobic um, digestion. 80% of San Francisco's food waste is diverted from the landfill. Um, 650 tons of material is sent to compost facilities every day. And you can see on the left there how it starts out as, as food waste, but also with waxed cardboard boxes that are compostable that held the produce in the first place. And that breaks down in 45 to 60 days, not the traditional 90 days, for composting into organic compostable material that Recology San Francisco sells to vineyards and um, farmers. Composting as regenerative agriculture is a real uh, growing field. Rangeland offers uh, a significant home for municipal compost. 
Uh, there are about 38 million acres of it in California. And the leaders in um, regenerative agriculture are in Marin County, north of San Francisco. The Marin Carbon Project um, illustrated here shows that compost can be spread on rangeland or pastures and um, sequester carbon and also add to the, the viability of the soil. You may uh, run into people um, selling food waste dehydrators and liquefiers. It's an incomplete solution. Um, dehydrators and liquefiers still have to uh, either compost or send their um, material to wastewater treatment plants. The, the effluent uh, from the discharge from these machines still has to be dealt with at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and is a problem in areas that don't have sufficient water because a lot of electricity and water are required, as well as uh, enzymes to break down the compost material. Um, so it's really not a complete solution. So the last resort is landfill or incineration. 43% of what gets sent to the landfills in the U.S. is either food waste, uh, green waste, yard clippings, or paper and cardboard. So if California eliminated methane that is emitted from landfills today, um, we would save 255,000 metric tons of methane from going into the atmosphere. Methane's really a highly potent uh, greenhouse gas, uh, as Emily said before, on a global warming potential basis, it's 84 times more powerful than carbon dioxide on a 20 year basis. Uh, globally, landfills and wastewater uh, emit 67 million tons of methane. That's 20% of all methane emissions, uh, according to the United Nations. So in California, if, if we prevented that methane from going into the atmosphere, it would be a climate benefit of taking nearly 4.7 million cars off the road, um, more than 31% of all passenger vehicles registered in the state. Um, addressing global methane uh, got a lot of support in the UN meeting in Glasgow, um, and a commitment was made uh, by 100 countries to reduce methane emissions from 2020 to levels by at least 30% by 2030. And that would achieve a, um, a, a 0.2 degrees Celsius uh, lessening of warming by 2050. And it doesn't sound like much, but addressing methane will buy us time to get our uh, greenhouse gas and global warming house in order uh, what consider that we're aiming for a 1.5 degree increase. Uh, so 0.2 is actually significant. And you can see uh, how methane is captured from the landfill on the right side of the slide. Uh, wells are drilled into landfill and the, the gas can be refined and turned into vehicle fuel or pipeline gas for electrical generation or other industrial applications. I want to talk a little bit about the psychology of food waste so you, you can understand um, where you stand uh, in relation to dealing with the problem. Uh, nobody wants to think that they are the problem. Indeed, 76% uh, of people surveyed by the Natural Resources Defense Council um, say that they um, do better than other people in terms of dealing with their food waste. There's confusion over labels, best buy, sell by, use by. Um, the confusion over date labels leads Americans to throw away an estimated $29 billion of safe food every year. So we suggest that you use your senses of sight and smell as well as reading the small little labels. And 
wasting food is really a byproduct of activities that have, that have a lot of good intentions, feeding your family healthy food, trying something new, hosting a, a party, eating healthier, cooking more. Somehow the waste is an invisible product, byproduct of that. And we're really into giant piles of food. As I said, I worked in the retail produce industry a long time ago, and that tall pyramid of apples or oranges or bananas is exactly what we tried to do. Abundant displays that are appealing and whoever bought a solo banana? Um, it's that heaping bread basket at dinner that nobody seems to finish in a, in a restaurant. Um, we, we overdo it because it makes us feel good. And uh, our, even our cookware and appliances are, are huge and um, much larger than we absolutely need for families of a smaller size. Our casserole dishes were designed for big family meals. Our plates are oversized. It's not helpful when you're trying to cut down on waste. And, you know, be mindful, but don't beat yourself up. Um, while we can't all install wind turbines on our lunch breaks, we can tweak our lunches and our lives in general to facilitate less waste. A few tips to reduce food waste, okay? Plan your menu for, for uh, the week. Set aside an hour or two on Saturday or Sunday and plan a weekly menu. Um, there are lots of recipes on the, on the internet and there are those things called cookbooks um, that some of us remember at our advanced ages that are really useful. Um, always shop with a list. Don't go to the store hungry. You're much more likely to buy only what you need if you have a list. Purchase the uglies. It's, uh, don't be afraid to, to take a twisted carrot or a bruised piece of fruit. Uh, they're the most likely to go to waste. And please learn how to store your foods properly. Most people's fridges are set to warm. You want your fridge and your freezer to be set at correct temperatures. And get creative with the leftovers. There's no reason not to have Sunday's dinner as Monday's lunch. You wanna freeze batches of dinner soups and sauces, um, stock with items like pasta sauce, uh, chili and soup in the freezer. And you can avoid that five o'clock scramble for what am I gonna cook for dinner? You'll have something on hand and freeze your uh, breakfast favorites. Uh, the freezer can be a real asset. It, you can still make waffles from scratch and freeze them and then put them in your toaster oven and you're all set. Um, you can even uh, hard boiled eggs the night before. It seems simple, but um, it's easily done. And compost those leftovers um, as the last resort, well, not a last resort, but as as the next to best last resort. It's um, check your municipality or town. Um, you can do it in your backyard. You can do it on a balcony. Uh, there are ways that you can compost and address your food waste firsthand. Some steps to reduce your uh, food print. Uh, this is a survey that was uh, done of 70,000, 57,000 uh, U.S. households in, uh, by Purdue University. Um, skip those unhealthy snacks. Uh, avoid the high calorie counts, low nutritional value, um, and reduce the total carbon footprint of uh, a typical use household in the United States by nearly 10%. Um, candy, soda, packaged snacks take a lot more ingredients and more processing, and that translates to higher environmental impacts. The bulk buys, um, a household of one or two people may end up with food waste when they try to save money with a, a bulk buy. Um, that three pound jar of peanut butter 
uh, will go bad before you use it all up. Uh, and trim back those ready-made meals. The, the uh, average microwave meal um, doesn't have a very large carbon footprint, but buying them regularly can add up to significant emissions. Um, these three changes uh, that were uh, published in the, the New York Times and, and the National Geographic Society magazine, if people made these changes, we could cut a quarter of emissions from household food consumption. And that's about 36 million um, metric tons, about 6.6 .6 million households generate in a year of electricity use. So uh, just an illustration of collective action being successful. And thank you for uh, playing along. Thank you, James. Um, I think now would be a good time for Q&A. So if Anna, you want to come back online with us. <laughs> so I've been trying to glance through um, some of these questions. And I know some of this has kind of been addressed uh, throughout the webinar. So I'll start um, with the question. The, so the fossil fuel industry linked to plastics is worth mentioning and why that industry is focused on amping up production. Yeah, so certainly, um, you know, I, this has been mentioned a little bit in the presentation, but, um, you know, plastics are a commodity and they are linked to uh, oil. So when oil is cheap, plastics are cheap. And, and that's why um, there hasn't really been this end in sight that um, we, we would hope. There's been no curbing of plastics because oil has remained low. Certainly that's changed a little bit in the last couple months, you know, the unfortunate war in Ukraine that that impacts um, the cost of, of these commodities, right? Um, does anybody have anything to, to add to yeah, that? Um, Before, yeah, it, di direct um, some stories here and trying to fit them all together. The, the bottom line is it's really complicated. Um, Pennsylvania is a, a an area where there's a lot of fracking going on and there is a lot of uh, natural gas being generated. Two years ago, Shell Oil decided to build a plastics plant near Pittsburgh and intended the intended target of all that plastic was uh, Eastern Africa. Um, a, but it's an interesting thing to see that we're making a commitment, the United States is to provide great amounts of liquefied natural gas to Europe to offset uh, the Russian uh, embargo. And um, so all that plastic may not be produced. The other thing is that there are commitments being made by corporations for certain percentages of recycled plastic. And um, in combination with the world prices and also with uh, China is not taking uh, plastic under their national sword policy. Um, the price of virgin plastic pellets has uh, grown closer to recycled. Virgin plastic and why people keep making new is cheaper than recycled. But it's now within 15 to 30 cents per ton and per pound, excuse me. And that means that uh, the impact of commitments, world prices, and transportation um, are all coming together to produce a better environment for recycling. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. Um, you know, the EPR bill that I meant bills that I mentioned, uh, as well as the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, which talks about producer responsibility as well. That's going to be an important key to this because uh, they can, you know, add fees to virgin plastics versus recycled plastics. I mean, it's all in the language of the EPR bill. If that's part of it, you know, we could really push the needle on uh, on boosting the the market for recycled plastics. And I see a lot of uh, comments from uh, our our friends at Replate. Do get in touch with them if you if 
they're not only operating in California, but uh, nationwide. Um, they're on the East Coast as well. Um, I think, Emily, they're, they're, they're getting into Baltimore area right now, I think. They have local partners everywhere. So it, yeah, yeah, if you're interested, I, I'm sure they will um, work something out. But yeah, that's it's a really great um, organization. So yeah, nice to nice to see that in the chat. <laughs> and thank um, you for being a bridge. It's really critical. Um, firsthand, we work with hotels uh, and uh, making sure that all that food that is laid out for a taco bar or a banquet isn't wasted is really a challenge. So I do want to get to a couple other questions. Um, James had answered this directly, but I wanted to bring it to everyone. Um, so up at the top before Anna went to uh, bioplastics, there's a question, uh, what is your view of biocompostable as an alternative? And uh, James said that, and I think we would all agree here, that uh, plant-based plastic requires fossil fuel to produce and proper disposal is often not available as Anna addressed, of course. And so our stance there is gonna always be reusables are the better choice, right? The go back to that waste hierarchy where it's reduce, then reuse, then recycle, right? So, um, it's just a more efficient process if you don't have that waste to think about in the first place. And I also want to confirm um, a couple of people have been asking about uh, sharing the slide deck. Happy to share the slide deck. We'll also share um, the uh, National Geographic Marine Debris Tracker app. So everyone has that, the how to recycle. I'll send uh, several resources that were mentioned just so everyone has that on deck. And also the recorded webinar will we'll be sharing with everyone um, when that's ready as well. It takes a little while to download, but <laughs> we'll, we'll be sharing that. And so let me just pull up, make sure I'm getting to everything. Um, for Kea's uh, question in the chat, what is the regulation atmosphere on BPA, the endocrine disrupting chemical leach from plastics when heated? we're not seeing a whole lot of BPA anymore. Uh, people have really stepped away from it uh, as a, a can liner uh, in, in processed food and also water bottles are widespread, not made out of BPA anymore. The, the problem nowadays, the, uh, another set of chemicals, uh, forever chemicals, PFAS, um, are leaching now from landfills and contaminating groundwater. Uh, we urge people to really be careful about um, anything that might have PFAS in it, uh, such as your old Teflon, um, time to retire that stuff. And we are at time. Uh, there's more questions that um, I'd love to get to. Um, quickly, I'm seeing what's the best way to recycle electronics. So um, Best Buy, Staples, those kind of um, uh, retail stores, they generally have take back programs. Um, your residential uh, programs also generally have pickups and drop offs. So lots of uh, take back programs, send back programs first um, before recycling. And yeah, uh, check locally is kind of always the, the first um, answer to try to answer that quickly. Um, and also, if there are additional questions, feel free to uh, email us at recycling at greatforest.com because I don't, I'm sure there's stuff I'm missing here and there's a lot of great questions and a lot of great engagement. So I don't want to miss out on that. Um, so I do have to close uh, by saying that we'd love to keep the conversation going, especially since there's um, so much engagement on the chat and the Q&A. And uh, as a follow up, we would really love to hear from you all. Um, you know, what have your successes and challenges have been uh, with your own experience with materials management? And now is really a great time to leverage, fingers crossed, uh, return to in-person activities by rethinking and redesigning our waste programs. Um, just like I was, you know, looking at my garbage last night and realizing I had misplaced stuff, right? So it's always good to kind of um, think through these things regularly. And um, please reach out to us, like I said, uh, recycling at greatforest.com. 
uh, to continue that conversation. Uh, we'd be happy to set up a call to discuss how we can help address your waste management challenges and also uh, build on those successes. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, thanks again. Wish we had more time. I uh, really appreciate all your engagement in our work and um, happy early Earth Day, everybody. Happy Earth Month. Um, have a great day. Thank, Thank you, you all for joining.